Hello, uh, my name is Brad Belt. I'm a member of the Town of Kiowa Island Council, and this is another in our periodic series of podcasts uh, that we host with area thought leaders, uh, business leaders, political leaders, non-governmental organization leaders that uh, uh, impact uh, the Kiowa Island community and the broader low country. Uh, this today, extraordinarily privileged to have with us Dr. Tanya Matthews, the president and CEO of the International African American Museum in Charleston, which just opened three months ago. <laughs> yes, just probably seems like uh, 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 years already. <laughs> uh, it's, it's not just the years, it's the mileage. Mm, exactly. That's a good way of saying it. Um, uh, this has been an extraordinary uh, uh, development for Charleston. Yes. Um, and uh, I want to talk about this sacred place and the story you're trying to tell, um, it, it's really both a sobering as well as an inspiring story. <laughs> Mayor Labriola and I uh, were extraordinarily privileged to be able to visit with uh, Dr. Matthews and her staff just before the museum officially opened, and it is truly a remarkable sacred place. Before we talk about, however, the journey that this place okay. represents, sure. I'd like to talk a little bit about the Dr. Tanya Matthews. <laughs> okay, sure. Uh, and and what led you from being born and raised in Washington D.C. Yeah. more recently from Michigan to come to this place? Um, you have uh, an extraordinarily distinguished background. Thank you. Um, uh, biomedical and electrical engineering degrees from Duke. Uh, uh, a doctorate in biomedical engineering from Johns Hopkins. <laughs> Uh, leading the Michigan Science Center, uh, at, uh, at adjunct uh, adjunct provost at um, Wayne State University. Um, how did that all come about? That's an interesting, circuitous path. It is. What's yes. you here? Yeah, you know, it's nice that at the end of the road they call it a distinguished career. My, I think my parents would have had some different words uh, as we were sort of marking all of those paths. But I think one of the things that has guided me is this sort of experiential learning and curiosity. Uh, so as you mentioned, I'm from the Washington, D.C. area. I grew up going back and forth to New Orleans, Louisiana, um, and very strong and solid in family. Uh, good at math and science. And so those were the years where they were trying to convince the young ladies to use the math and science. Um, and at that time, you know, as now, I kind of wanted to save the world or change the world or do something impactful. And of course, the medical field uh, is in that space. And that's what ultimately drove me to biomedical engineering. I decided that instead of simply being a doctor, I would make the equipment that all doctors used. Uh, and so that's where, where that came from. But I think very much uh, similar to my mother's path, at some point, I also began considering education. Uh, and community engagement as a part of the Save the World uh, plan. And that actually brought me to museums. Museums are really interesting places. You know, we are part of the education ecosystem, um, but we are also a place of fun. And again, that magic word, curiosity. Uh, and I really appreciated that because though I was definitely a school nerd, um, I realized a lot of folks weren't. Uh, and there was some inspiration that needed to go into the education path for them. And that's where museums actually came in. I like to say we're the sugar on top. So you come to the museum, then you actually want to do your homework uh, in that way. And so that then put me in museums uh, and full-fledged into education. And so when I was in Detroit uh, and I got the call uh, about the International African American Museum uh, looking for uh, the leader that would help to, to take us uh, into this next phase of our journey to get us across that finish line, I was... I was humbled. I was floored. I was excited. I was also surprised we weren't open yet because being in the museum field, I had actually known um, about the ideas and the concepts of the museum uh, for more than a decade. Uh, and so it was just really exciting to to come here and to be in this space. Um, and the more I know about South Carolina, the more I realize all roads lead uh, to, to South Carolina one way or another. And so I think... Um, it makes perfect sense uh, that my path has led me here now. Well, you, there are other interesting aspects of your background that I've learned about. Uh, uh, you're a published author, but also a published poet. Yes. 
Yes, yes, yes. Do we get a reading of the uh, 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 of the Dr. Tanya Mathers? Uh, no, there is morning? there is no spontaneous uh, sort of saying of words, but it is it is very interesting. Um, you know, I, I think sometimes we like that that term full brain and and whole brain, and so you know, I'm very logical and methodical in a lot of things that I do, but the way that I express myself uh, and bring folks uh, into that conversation tends to be poetic. I have my staff sometimes say that that's a little too much metaphor, Dr. Matthews, can you just bring it down? And sometimes they'll say, okay, that is way too linear. We're going to need some inspiration to go with that. And so swinging, I think, back and forth. But, you know, it's one of the themes that even runs through the museum itself. You know, we have snippets of poetry inside uh, the African American History Museum. We're, we're sitting next to some of it uh, right there. And so I think that art of uh, that storytelling um, expressions um, of our lives and our being is is also something that culturally uh, runs runs through that space. And my parents did not discourage me, maybe because they thought I'd also have an engineering degree as backup. Well, uh, maybe next time, if we have an opportunity to do another one of these podcasts <laughs> with you, it won't be Langston Hughes. It'll be sure. where your poems <laughs> that'll be the backdrop. Uh, so now let's talk about this sacred place. Mm -hmm. um, and and maybe you can start with the building and and its location sure. and its meaning. Yeah. So, you know, I think many folks uh, have come to understand at this point uh, that we've been built on the site of Gadsden's Wharf. Uh, Gadsden's Wharf is the site of a former transatlantic slave trading port, uh, one of the largest, most prolific uh, in North America, definitely in the United States. Um, historians would argue upwards of 40% of enslaved Africans that came into what is now the United States would have come in uh, and through our uh, wharf uh, right here. Uh, and so this is perhaps the last little piece of, of this space that had not been claimed uh, at the time that the museum uh, chose to, to build here. Uh, and so then you have the building itself. And I think one of the things um, that we shouldn't take for granted, those of us here in the low country now, is that it's not often that museums get to honor the power of place. We have monuments and memorials and parks and those kinds of things that are usually at these sites of pilgrimage, if you will. So it is quite an honor uh, and a distinction for the museum to actually be built upon the site that is grounding uh, the stories that we tell. So you go from, you know, the, the, the ground, uh, and now we have the African Ancestors Memorial Garden to interpret that space, and the museum rises above it. Uh, and a fun fact is that the museum actually rises above it because the architect took on our language of this being sacred ground. And out of that understanding, he decided that, therefore, the building was not going to touch the ground, to leave the ground, uh, to have its own say uh, in our conversation. So... Once you're in the building, mm -hmm. tell us about what the story is that you're trying to tell, what people should take away from mm. this. Because as I said at the outset, um, from, from my perspective, when we walked through here, it was an extraordinarily sobering, mm -hmm. but also ultimately very inspiring. Yeah. Uh, kind of interesting duality to mm -hmm. much of the story that's being told here. Yeah. I, I love the way that you're, you're phrasing that. I think when people come, they'll feel two of our guiding ethics, which is one, we understand uh, our power of place and that our story is rooted here in, in the low country in Gadsden's Wharf. Um, but we intentionally honor the fact that this period of slavery and enslavement is neither the beginning nor the end of the African-American journey. It's in the middle, and we treat it that way. Uh, the timeline of the museum goes all the way back to 300 BCE and all the way up to 2021. It's a lot to get in a little bitty building. Uh, the second thing that you'll notice is that as a point of personal and professional uh, privilege, um, for me, one of the greatest gifts of understanding the African-American journey is being able to understand our ability to simultaneously hold the sensations of trauma and joy. Not trauma on Tuesday and joy on Thursday. It is all woven in together. And that's the way we tell the stories. And so that's why you feel uh, that level of, of duality. So there is not a, a sad gallery and a happy gallery. What we try to do is that every story is told uh, in its full context. I think um, that's about understanding how we get into the story. The other things I will warn folks about physically going through the museum, it's about 10 galleries, plus the Center for Family History. Uh, the east wing of the building is culturally and geographically organized. You'll see 
energy, you'll see a mix and a match of African-American history, South Carolina African-American history, but also connections to the African diaspora all over the world. Uh, and this is where our soon to be famous Gullah Geechee Gallery is as well on that side. The West Wing of the building takes a more chronological approach. You know, you'll march from the 1400s all the way up to, to modern times as we tell perhaps hidden stories uh, inside the American journey uh, that African-Americans have played a, a great role in. And um, also deliberately, the Center for Family History anchors the West Wing of the building. This is our ancestry and geology, genealogy uh, center. Once you learn uh, the big story, the country story, the African-American story, we want folks to learn a bit about their own story. And so we have the genealogy center right here in our museum. So you mentioned Gullah Geechee, uh, uh, the new gallery that will be coming online. Uh, that, that perhaps provides some connective tissue to uh, Kiowa Island yeah. and the, the, the Sea Islands, mm -hmm. John's Island, mm -hmm. because that's really where the culture developed, the yeah. Gullah Geechee expanded uh, up and down the mm -hmm. coast. Um, if you can talk a little bit about what we can expect from that and what what people who live on the sea islands mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. should think about in yeah. terms of where they live now and who used to live on those places. Yeah, yeah. I think one of the things we may take for granted just being in this uh, space is understanding how extraordinary uh, the sea islands and sea island communities are. It's why uh, the Gullah Geechee uh, people and the corridor is located here and say not in the heart of Alabama, mm -hmm. right? It was specifically about the way um, our land um, and our plantations were structured, which allowed uh, or forced sometimes a bit of isolation uh, that allowed for extraordinary maintenance of the culture. Uh, the ability to pass things on and on and on. And this wasn't out of the kindness of anyone's heart. Uh, the work there was so hard. The land was so inhospitable. Uh, I know that we do a lot of work to protect ourselves from the mosquitoes, but trust, uh, even even in that time, uh, think about the mosquitoes, the, the alligators, the snakes, the high waters, the flooding. And so often those who own these plantations and these individuals would have homes elsewhere. And so that ability, if not that requirement um, for some self-sufficiency, even inside uh, the plantation system, allowed for West African culture to translate uh, and to uh, mature and to grow generation after generation. And I think one of the things to also think about is this wasn't just a then uh, conversation. After the Civil War, that's not where we put infrastructure. Uh, many folks know that the bridges came late Right, which means that these African American communities continued uh, in the space of forced isolation. But like we do with many things, um, there was um, there were blessings in that. There was ability to use that to maintain a sense of self. And so here we have the Gullah Geechee uh, community uh, and those who identify as Gullah. This is not an old foreign culture uh, that we're talking about. These are uh, people who are alive and well. And one of the interesting things is. As you come into our museum and perhaps as you travel, you will start to hear and recognize things. When you go to, say, Caribbean islands, they were also colonized by the British. You'll start to recognize a lot of similarities in the way the language sounds and the way the movement works. Uh, all of that was, was about this rigorous maintenance of connection uh, to our origin cultures on the west coast of Africa. Well, and it's it's interesting if you go through the museum here and visit some of the other sites that are around uh, in the Cloud Plantation, yeah. the Kaka Interpretive Center, mm -hmm. you you realize then how impactful mm. the 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 community was. Uh, there were capabilities and technologies and skills yeah. that were you know forcibly brought mm -hmm. from Africa. But those skills were developed in Africa. That's yeah. the, the the those who were enslaved were you know had built rice uh, fields and yeah. in, uh, in, on Africa. And it, when you when you come here and see like a Kaka Interpretive Center, yeah. how much work was required in yeah. order to to make all of that a reality, enriching mm -hmm. a certain very small slice of the population at the expense uh, of 
the uh, of everyone else. Yeah, absolutely. It's one of the things that I appreciate about how we get into the story, which is, you know, we do try to tell the, the full truth. That was one of the questions we got. Would we be able to tell the truth? And so, of course, we tell the truth of the, bu- the brutality, the inhumanity of the institution of slavery. And we talk about all of the labor that was required, the generations upon generations of labor that was required. But we don't do that at with at the expense of talking about the genius uh, and the innovation and the technology. And we argue that it was never just the labor. Uh, if you wanted folks that understood how to put together buildings, how to uh, erect spaces, tabby, uh, the, that, that shell-infused concrete um, that's so common here, those were also skills that were brought. Definitely how to terraform the land and, and grow rice uh, in this space. I think those of us who are used to getting rice on aisle three at Whole Foods sometimes sort of dismiss what it actually means to try to grow at the border of fresh and salt water. Mm-hmm. This was part of the skill set, part of the knowledge uh, that was brought with, uh, with the West Africans, particularly those who came from communities that were also already growing rice. Uh, and we leveraged that. Uh, and we did use that. Uh, and you are right, it benefited a small portion of the population. And so one of the things that we can at least do at this moment is give credit where credit is due and reclaim that part of the story. Very good. So you're now three months in. <laughs> what what uh, what are the lessons you've learned thus far? Yeah. Uh, what works well? What doesn't? What changes do you foresee? And, and wh- where do you see the museum yeah. going in the future? I think one of the things that I've really learned is, is that, that my tribe, my people, the curious people, that's what I call them, mm-hmm. Group is much larger than I thought. Uh, in our first two months, we had fifty thousand visitors. Okay, first of all, I wasn't even quite sure we could hold fifty thousand uh, visitors, and it was amazing and extraordinary. Uh, and the the tide of curiosity has continued, and so that's one of the things that that we've learned uh, that has, um, I think, um, surprised and, and energized us. Not that we didn't think uh, that folks would come, but they would come so rapidly, so quickly that they would buy literally every book in the bookstore Mm -hmm. um, were putting us in position to have a more formalized relationship with a local um, distributor of books here. So I think that was one, um, that curiosity is is still the predominant uh, sentiment of humanity that prevails. Uh, That is exciting. Um, I think the second thing that we learned is that um, this is a bit of a communal space. Um, People are actually pausing to read or watch whole videos and and of course, in a space like this, you're shoulder to shoulder, perhaps with a stranger. Uh, and the way that we're telling the story, the way our galleries are structured, folks are having conversations with strangers about the stories we tell in this museum. Uh, and I think it's one of the things that, that folks have been most worried about, um, that we can't have these conversations. And so we're learning. You create the right space, you bring the right energy, uh, and that will happen. So I'm very excited about those things um, that we've learned. Uh, And now we're we're learning how to also be a partner. Uh, We've been partnering with lots of institutions and organizations during our building process. But now that we also have our own space uh, to offer, uh, in addition to all of the goodwill, uh, thinking about how we can use our space, not just for our programs, but sharing with uh, community organizations, uh, be that other history organizations, be that the Gilead that we've got some ongoing programming with. Um, I'm looking for one of our extraordinary, unusual partnerships. We'll be doing some things with the aquarium, which folks are like, really, what are you going to do? We don't know yet. We just know we're going to be doing something uh, because we're, we're neighbors and those stories intertwine. Just a couple hundred yards. Just down, a down. couple hundred yards. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so th- so those are the kinds of things that, that, we're, that we've discovered and that we're learning right now. Well, certainly, uh, you brought a lot of attention the museum has to Charleston. I mean, the the number of stories, the glowing yeah. stories yeah. that have been written about the museum's opening and the story that it's telling is remarkable. Um, uh, I think it's a uh, just encourage uh, the folks who watch this podcast in uh, Kiowa Island, Seabrook, mm-hmm. and Johns mm-hmm. Island. Uh, if you haven't been yet to the museum, do come. It's an extraordinary experience. Uh, you'll see Dr. Matthews wandering around a cave. Well, I, I wander. <laughs> she wanders. She's always on the go. Uh, uh, it's been you've been so gracious with your time today. Uh, it, you. It's it's remarkable what you've been able to accomplish and your team has been able to accomplish in a, such a short period of time. 
And uh, I think we all look forward to to the journey continuing. Absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you so much for, for having me in this conversation. Thank you very much, Dr. Matthews.